Hi guys, welcome back to Data Every Day. Uh, today we are looking at a data set of airline customers. Uh, each one has a series of features associated with them. And then at the end of these 23 columns, we have a target column. Actually, sorry, it's at the beginning here. Uh, satisfied or dissatisfied. And we're going to try to predict this, whether a given patient is satisfied or not, based on the features. So uh, I'd like to point out the class distribution on this is quite even so we don't have to worry about class imbalance. Let's hop into the notebook. Um, so we're using NumPy and SciPy. Actually, before I begin, I'd like to point out uh, we are going to be doing an outlier detection and removal on this data. Um, so we're going to use z-scores for that. And so I'm importing SciPy.stats, which will contain the z-score function. Um, we're also using pandas to work with the data. Uh, and then to visualize some of the outliers, we're going to use PyPlot and Seaborn. Then for pre-processing, just uh, train test split and standard scalar from sklearn. Finally, we'll make our predictions using a logistic regression model. So let's go ahead and import this. Uh, and we can load in the data from this file path up here. I'm going to copy that using pandas.readcsv. Um, paste in the file path, and let's store the data in data. So here's the raw data. Um, so most of these are um, numeric features. They've already been uh, encoded as they need to be. Uh, the only thing we have to worry about are these ones. Um, I'm going to leave satisfaction since it's our class column. But all the others, uh, all the other text label columns, we're going to have to encode. So let's get a little more info with data.info. Um, and we can look for missing values here. Uh, it looks like the only column with missing values is the arrival delay in minutes column. Um, and I can't be sure. Yeah, I don't think uh, missing values are meant to be encoded as zero because we already have zeros in the column. So I'm going to assume uh, they are actually missing and we're going to fill them in using the mean of the column. So why don't we create a function? Uh, just say preprocessing. We're going to create a function. Whoops. Uh, called preprocess inputs. And this is going to take in a data frame. Uh, it's going to make a copy of the data frame. And for now, it'll just return the data frame. So right now, this function just makes a copy of our data. I'll call the copy x. Uh, and the preprocess inputs function will take in data. To s and so this is the copy that we're going to modify uh, for preprocessing. So um, I guess we can fill the missing values to start. Uh, it's the arrival delay, right? Is the name arrival delay in minutes? Uh, so film missing arrival delay uh, values with column mean. To do this, we just take the column, uh, type dot fill in a to fill missing values with whatever value we specify, and the value we want to specify is the mean of the column. So I'm taking the column, getting the mean, and then filling the missing values. Um, then we'll just store that into the original column. And if we run this now, I can't see any difference, but if we now check out how many missing values we have with x dot is an a, you can see uh, we no longer have any missing values in this column. All right, so now we just do the encoding. Um, so pretty simple encoding. Uh, I think there's one uh, nominal feature, but the others are binary. So to get us a look at this, we can get our dictionary. that's going to map the column name to the number of missing values uh, sorry, of unique values in that column. So I'm taking the unique values in the column, taking the length, and I'm doing that for every column in x dot columns. Now we can see how many values are in each column. However, I am only really concerned with um, the text columns. So instead of dot x dot columns, I'm going to do x dot select d types object. And this will exclude the numeric columns. Uh, so I can see just the text ones. All right, now satisfaction I'm ignoring since that's, that's our class. Uh, but these ones are the features that we want to encode. So three of them have two values. Uh, and for a two-valued uh, categorical feature, uh, you'll always use binary encoding, which basically just means uh, send one of the values to 0, the other to 1, and you're done. So let's do that. Binary encoding. Um, I'm going to take each one separately. So we'll start with gender take the gender column and call dot replace on it. Um, and the replace function can take in a dictionary with the mapping you want for the values in the column. 
So we'll send female to zero and male to one. So we just do it like this. Um, and we're good to go. And we'll store the result back in gender. Whoops. All right, now let's copy that over uh, for each of the other ones. We're gonna do customer type next. So I'll just paste in here. And the replace, yeah, let me just uh, indent this to make it nicer so we can see these clearer. Um, whoops. All right, so for the customer type, um, the two values are disloyal customer and loyal customer. So let's put disloyal customer to zero and we'll make loyal customer to one. Uh, finally, we have the last uh, binary feature is type of travel. Let's go up and paste that in. And the, uh, the in there we have personal travel and I can't actually see the other value. So I'm gonna uh, change this into a list so that we can see the actual values in uh, each one. Um, and so we have personal travel and business travel. So let's copy that in and uh, we'll send personal travel to zero and business travel to one. Now if I run this and we take a look, um, you can see gender has become zeros and ones, customer type has become zeros and ones, and type of travel has become zeros and ones, even though we can't see any of the ones here. And now if we look at this, there's only one uh, feature remaining. Again, we're not worrying about the satisfaction class. Uh, we're worrying about this class feature, uh, which is the flight class. And there's three values. And so for three values, we can't use binary encoding. For this, we're going to use um, one hot encoding, which let's take in the class column and get the dummies for it with pandas docket dummies. That will send each of these unique values to its own column. Um, and then a one will represent the original value of an example. So each, uh, each example now has three columns and there's going to be a one in only one of them will have a one and the others will have zeros. Uh, we can also add on a prefix here maybe call it flight class um, and that will just put flight class at the beginning this could be anything you want we could keep it as class um, but I'm trying to avoid class because that can sometimes mean target so I'm gonna do flight class uh, and we can now just use these as the new encoding of the column so let's copy this uh, let's bring it up into our function do the one hot encoding uh, and we'll st we'll call these flight class dummies and just change x to df and then we'll take the data frame and concatenate together the original df and the new flight class dummies uh, side by side so axis one and then when we're done we can drop the original class column since uh, we've already extracted all the information from it so if I run this now uh, you can see that the column is missing and at the end here, we have our one hots are concatenated onto our data frame. So at this point, everything is in numeric form. Uh, we're finished with encoding. We filled the missing values. Uh, the last thing to do would be to split and scale the data. But before I do that, I want to do the outlier detection. So let me uh, delete this and do outlier detection. So, um, Let's, to detect the outliers, a really useful way to do this is with box plots. And uh, Seaborn has a nice box plot function. What I want to do is create uh, set a new copy of the data frame when I'm uh, messing around with EDA, um, exploratory data analysis. So we're just going to make a copy of X, um, but we're going to drop the satisfaction column from it because we don't we don't care about the class when we're looking at these um, because. Uh, we can't say there's an outlier in the class. There's only two values, and um, it's also a text column, so I just want to exclude it from here. So we're dropping it from axis one, uh, and then I'll make a copy. So this is called EDADF, and that's what we're going to use for the box plots. Then I want to get a list of the non-binary columns. Uh, the reason for this is there's no point in looking for outliers in binary columns because there's only two values. Um, so if you if you were to see an outlier, um, let's say there is only one little tiny example of a positive uh, of of one of the values, and most of the other values were in the other value, 
um, then even if you drop that, the column will become useless because it would only contain one value after that. Uh, so we don't want to look at binary columns when we're dealing with uh, outliers. So I'm going to create a list of those non-binary columns uh, by using list comprehension uh, for every column. Uh, we're going to say column for every column in x doc, uh, sorry, edadf.columns. Um, so we're going to create this list of all the columns, but only if um, this, a specific column's unique values are greater than 2. So I'll get the length of this and check if they're greater than 2. So if, uh, if we have more than two unique values, meaning it's non-binary, then we'll send that column into this list. Um, and once we have all those non-binary columns, I'd like to plot the box plots. So let's create a new pie plot figure with a figure size of 20 by 20. Uh, and then for each column in uh, just the non-binary columns. So I'm taking EDADF and then subscripting it with non-binary columns. You remove that, that underscore. Um, and then take the columns of that. Uh, I guess we could also wait, we can just do this for each column in non binary columns. Um, then we're going to create a new subplot. Uh, and because I believe we have 18 in the non binaries, if I just run this, and uh, EDA is not defined. Sorry, EDADF. If I run this and take a look at how many non-binary columns we have, you see we have 18. Uh, so I want to think, what's the best grid for 18 uh, plots? Well, we could do 6 times 3, which is quite nice. Um, so I'll make 3 rows with 6 columns. So this is going to be in a 3 by 6 grid. And it's going to be indexed. I, I need an integer index here. here. So I'm going to enumerate this i sub i comma column in enumerate non-binary columns. Uh, so we'll assign an integer to each one, and we'll index this with i plus one. Uh, the plus one is because we need to start with one when using the subplot function instead of zero. And then once we create the subplot, we'll create the box plot using Seaborn SNS dot box plot. The data we want is edadf sub column, so a specific column of our edadf given by whatever we're iterating through. Um, and I'll just give it a color of dark violet, just because I want to. And we'll give it a title. Uh, title is just going to be the name of the column. Okay. And when we're done, I'll give this whole plot a title with subtitle, uh, and it will be box plots without uh, with outliers. And I'll give this a si font size of 30, and show the plot. So here it is. Uh, here are our box plots for each column. So um, you can see uh, the way box plot works, if you're not sure, um, we have here uh, the median, which is the line in the middle of the box. Then we have the first and third quartiles. Uh, the median is also the second quartile. Uh, and then these lines on the edge, they're sort of um, indicators of when the outliers begin. So this is actually calculated by uh, taking the interquartile range, which is the third quartile minus the first quartile, uh, and then subtracting, uh, multiplying that by 1.5 and subtracting it away from the median. Uh, so basically, uh, it's sort of a measure. Wait, uh, give me one second. Uh, let's see something. Okay, um, I just wanted to double check what I was saying about the whisker. Uh, it is true. This is. Um, 1.5 times the interquartile range subtracted from the median, but only representing the largest example that it finds within that range. So that's why we see it's shorter on one side and longer on the other, um, because there may not be an example up here that is the same length. Okay, that's a, just a side note. Um, this The reason it's useful is because we can see that examples that lie outside of this uh, whisker um, are can be considered outliers, uh, because most of the data lies within this block. Um, so having these guys, uh, you can see they're, sometimes outliers can throw off the model um, because it can give the model uh, sort of edge cases that, well, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's you could think of it sort of as unrealistic, 
However, it's, it's hard to say. You know, you might want to include those in the model. It's really a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but we will take a look at whether it, it inc uh, increases the performance of the model or not later. Um, now, I want to point out here, you can see that the, the IQR, uh, this whisker, is really close. All the data is concentrated here. And it looks like we have a lot of outliers. However, I wouldn't consider these all as outliers because you can see it tapers off. Um, however, this guy might be an outlier because it is um, significantly uh, displaced from the other ones. Now, when you have all of the dots really close to each other, those are an outliers. But when you have these ones, like these two, that are quite far, um, they are. And so it's interesting to consider these ones as outliers because they are in categorical features. Uh, these, this is a, f a feature that can take values of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. Now, most of the examples lie between 2 and 5, but there are a few down here uh, that don't. So we're going to try out different things, see if maybe taking these away will help the model or not. It's just nice to see this because now we know which, uh, which features to target for the outlier removal and which not to. Anything that doesn't have outliers like these ones, I'm going to leave alone. Um, we're not going to uh, worry about those. Okay. So next thing to do is create a function that can actually remove the outliers. So outlier removal. All right, so for this, we're going to use z-scores. And the idea of a z-score um, is sort of like, OK, you can consider each distribution as having a, um, a dist well, e sorry, each variable, each, each feature as having a distribution. Um, if we make the assumption that a variable is normally distributed, and we can shift and scale it to fall in line with a standard normal distribution, and then calculate the, uh, the value of its PDF uh, that results in a certain, or maybe CDF. Uh, let, let, let me explain this uh, with a, a graph. Um, so I'll open up Desmos, and let's look at the standard normal, which is um, 1 over square root of 2 pi times uh, x to the negative, uh, sorry, e to the negative x squared. So here's our standard normal. Um, and if you shift and scale any distribution to match this standard normal, then we can use these markings along the x-axis to d denote when an outlier is. Um, let's say we choose this as the threshold. Then anything that has a z-score, or in other words, uh, x value that is greater than 2.5, uh, will be considered an outlier. Now this is assuming that the, the data has been shifted and scaled to match this curve. So let's say we make the threshold here. Then anything with a z-score of greater than 1.5 will be considered an outlier. Uh, we can get the z-score for every example using the scipy.stats dot z-score. And let's say we do this for just one column. Let's take the departure delay in minutes. Uh, you can see we have, uh, let's look at it as a series. Uh, each example has its own z-score. And the, the, re the way it found this is by taking the whole distribution, fitting it to the standard normal, and then checking each example, each value, and seeing where it lies along the distribution. Then the x-coordinate of that example is going to be the z-score. Um, and so it's if the mo the higher or lower this is, the farther away from zero it is, because zero is the mean. Uh, the more extreme the example is, the more likely it is to be an outlier. If we have a really high z-score, uh, I think there's one here is seven. Uh, that means that the data point is all the way over here, and so it can easily be considered an outlier. Um, now most of them are going to lie around zero. Uh, some of he some here are four and three, so this this most of them are lying right around here in the mean of the distribution. Some of them are over here, four and three, and if there's a, enough around here, which if you look back up at this, it does look like there are quite a few uh, tapering off uh, on the positive end. Um, then you might not consider these outliers, but the one all the way over in seven, 
which might be one of these guys, not sure exactly, uh, could be considered an outlier. So we're going to use these scores to um, detect these guys. And I want to create a function called remove outliers that's going to do this for us. So the remove outliers function um, is going to take in a data frame and a list of columns that we'd like to remove outliers from. So when we're looking through here, uh, when we find an outlier, we're going to remove that whole example uh, with all of the rest of the data as well, um, all the rest of the inputs, the features. So we we don't want to do it for all columns. We want to just pick the columns with outliers and then remove the examples where those columns have uh, outlier data. So over here, uh, we also want to specify a threshold. And the threshold is giving us well, where along the x-axis are we going to make the cut? Where are we going to say uh, are these, these are outliers and these aren't? So that's up to us. And we're actually not going to do it using z-scores explicitly. We're going to use uh, percentiles uh, or quantiles. Um, so how we can do that, uh, if we look at, this is a scipy.stats documentation. Um, you can see here, uh, we, this is the z-score function. Um, and we also specify an axis along which we'd like to calculate z-scores. Uh, default is zero, that means we're looking down the whole column, we're looking down the rows, to get the z-score distribution uh, for each column. If we did this as one, then it'd get it for each row, which we don't want. So we want to make sure this stays as zero. Um, so let me also include over here, axis equals zero. It should be the same. Um, now I want to actually check out uh, scipy.stats. I want to find uh, continuous distributions. Uh, so these are the distributions. I'm looking for the normal distribution because that is what the z-score relies on. Um, so norm, here it is. So the norm, a uh, normal distribution, takes in, uh, let's see, it takes in, okay, it takes, uh, well, for example, actually, let's look at this. These, these are the methods um, for the normal distribution. So we can get the PDF, uh, which is just this thing, this actual function right here. Um, we can also get the CDF, which is the cumulative distribution function, which adds up the past values, uh, which is making it monotonically increasing. Uh, actually, I'm not going to... Yeah, okay, so... We're looking at... I want to look at the PPF. This is the per percent point function, which is the inverse of the CDF. It's basically the percentile function. Um, this is going to give us the threshold values based on a, on a percentage. So uh, let's look at that. It takes in the qu uh, quantile we want, then it, the mean is given by loc, and the uh, variance is given by scale. We need to make sure this stays as 0 and this stays as 1, because that's the standard normal, which is where the z-scores are calculated from. So uh, well, let's, do, let's do this, scipy.stats dot norm dot ppf um, this takes a q a loc and a scale now like I said loc has to be 0 scale has to be 1 the q is the percent we like so let's say 95 percent uh, so 0 0.95 um, so that gives us back a z-score value representing when the data um, is in the 95 percentile so here's the threshold value on, uh, so for example, let's say we want to find the, the z-score uh, representing the 95 percentile threshold. Well, here it is, 1.64. Looking back at our graph, if we look at 1.64, which is right around here, um, 1.64, this is the threshold for the 95 percentile. What that means is before this, all this data, before that, that threshold, is 95 percent of the data in the distribution. Now, if we, we move this down to 50%, which should give us the median, it's zero. Um, and that's because we have it right here. Um, that's the median. If we bump it up to 75, we get 0.67. And so that lies right around here. And that's, that's saying that before this, 75% of the data has passed. 
So what I want to do is I want to get thresholds uh, on the positive and negative side of the distribution based on our, what we specify as the quantile here. So let's take 95% for example. Let's say I want 95% of the data included and anything that lies in the most extreme 5% we're going to exclude. So um, we have to specify a lower and upper bound. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to create this threshold value which is going to be what we want, let's say 5%. So the 5% is uh, the, the part of the data that we are looking for outliers in. So if we look at the, if you consider that, okay, so where is the 5% uh, threshold here? Where is 5% of the data located? Well, the, the, the minimum 5%, we don't just want to look on this side because we could have outliers on the negative side as well. So what we're going to do is split that threshold of 5% into two. So we have 2.5% and 2.5% and place each one on either side. So we'll have the 2.5% percentile up here and the 2.5 percentile over here. Um, and so for that, we'll take threshold and divide it by two. Uh, what do you mean invalid syntax? Okay, there we go. All right, so threshold um, divided by two is going to give us the the um, the portion to look for on this side and on this side, um, and if we look back at this, uh, we can use this value threshold divided by two as our Q, uh, and that will give us the negative bound because that's saying okay only half of the threshold on this side. Uh, it was like point point nine six I believe uh, right here, so anything on this side. Uh, after this threshold we'll worry about. And now we want the upper bound. So what we'll do is we'll take this and do one minus threshold divided by two. And that gives us the 0.975 uh, value, which is one minus 0.25. Um, sorry, 0.025, 2.5%. Um, and this is going to be our upper bound. So uh, why don't we copy this and take this one and put it in here. So we have threshold over two as our lower bound and one minus threshold over two as our upper bound. So uh, those should be negative of each other. Uh, if we look at this, um, this is negative 0.96. This is positive 1.96, sorry, 1.96. Um, and so this is gonna be our lower bound on the z-score for outliers. And this is gonna be our upper bound on the z-score for outliers. And if I change the threshold, maybe make it more extreme, so we're only looking for outliers in the, the lowest or greatest point, uh, uh, 1%, the lowest or greatest 1% of the, of the distribution, then this should go down and this should go up. And you can see now it's targeting Z, Z scores that are further away. So the, low, the higher we make the threshold, let's, say, uh, let's make this up to 25%. So we're now we're ca classifying anything that's in the higher or lower 25%, uh, the, the most, the 25% most extreme examples. Uh, now these should be really close to the mean. We have 1.15 and negative 1.15. Uh, and that's like here and here. And so anything past this or past this is in the 25% most extreme examples. So if you make this really close, uh, really high, like 0.95, then we get them really close to zero because now we're only looking within this range and anything outside of it is considered as uh, outliers. All right, uh, so uh, enough ex explanation. Let's actually implement this um, in our function, remove outliers. So we're going to start by creating a copy of the data frame so that we don't uh, modify the original version of it. And the first thing I want to do is calculate the lower lower and upper bounds uh, on on the z distribution which is the standard normal distribution that I showed given a threshold value um, so we'll get our lower bound uh, which is going to be the 
the threshold on this side, and that's going to be given by this thing, uh, this thing here. So we're taking the threshold, dividing it by two, uh, and then getting the z-score associated with that. Just only thing. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Now our upper bound is given by this one, which is one minus the threshold divided by two. So that will put it on the right side over here. Okay. Um, so if we just check that, if we return, let's just return the upper bound to check to make sure this is working. Call remove outliers um, on our data frame. So our DF is gonna be X. The columns we wanna target. So this is when we're looking at this uh, and we want to find the ones with outliers. So why don't we just pick all the ones that have possible outliers? So onboard service, onboard service, uh, hyphen there. Then we have um, check-in service, and then these last two columns. Check-in service. Okay, uh, and the last ones are um, departure delay in minutes and arrival delay in minutes. Okay, I think that's how it is. Yeah, okay. And then last we specify the threshold. So let's do a uh, point Oh, 05, so the 5% the most extreme examples we will get rid of. Um, remove, not remover. All right, and that's the upper bound. So right now the columns we specify don't matter. We're just calculating the lower and upper bound given the threshold. Now let's actually get the z-scores. Calculate uh, z-scores of every example in the columns specified. So. We're going to pass in the columns, uh, and we want to get the z-scores for each one, for each example. So we're going to create this new data frame called outlier df, and what I want to do is just take the portion of the data contained in the samples in the columns we specify. So I'm doing df.loc, all rows, and just the columns we pass in, and make a copy of that. Uh, and let's return outlier df to see that. Uh, so it's this is still all the data, but it's only the columns that we're specifying here. Um, then with that, we're going to get z-scores for it. So I'll call it z-scores, and that's going to be scipy.stats.zscore um, for outlier df along axis 0, which is uh, the row axis like we did before, um, to get the z-score with respect to the distribution of the columns. Then I want to return z-scores. And here are the z-scores, uh, one for each of the columns uh, and each of the examples in that column. So I could return this as a data frame down here maybe, pd.dataframe just so we can see it nicer. Uh, you can see that each, um, uh, I'll include the column names. Uh, you can see that uh, each column has now had its z-scores calculated and we can now use the thresholds we found, the lower and upper bounds, to exclude examples that have too extreme of a z-score. So what we'll do first is get some Boolean arrays denoting the outlier examples. So true if, the, if it's an outlier, false if it's not. We can get the lower bound outliers by checking uh, if z-scores which is this thing right here, is less than our lower bound. Um, and if I return this now, you can see we have uh, for each column, you know what, let me just keep this as a data frame so that it's, we understand. I'll keep the indices the same as they were in outlier df and the columns the same as well. Okay. 
So um, we have a, a true in any one of these if there's a, a an outlier um, in that column, uh, in that example. So if we sum over this dot sum along the row axis, you can see we have five outliers in onboard service, one outlier in check-in service. Um, however, I want to sort of um, no, I only I only want to know if there's one in the row. So I'm not concerned with uh, basically if, if any one of these is true in a given row, we're going to classify that whole row as an outlier row. So for this we can use dot any along axis one. And that will just consolidate them with an or, uh, a logical or, to give us the total number, uh, th to just give us if there's a true in a given row. We can then sum over this to see there are six total outliers in the data. Um, right. So I would like to point out that um, we only had like a few negative outliers here on the lower bound part. Most of our outliers are lying on the upper bounds of these. So we're only getting six. Um, so we use the any to combine all of these um, all of these columns to get whether or not a row is an outlier. So we'll take this um, type dot any along axis one and we'll do the same thing for our upper outliers but check if z-scores is greater than or equal to our upper bound. So this, these will be Boolean arrays that denote the uh, outlier examples within the lower and upper bounds. I mean, outside of them. Then once we have these, let's get the indices of all outlier examples. So uh, what we'll do is take um, Okay, we will take the, we'll take both of these lower and up and uppers and use pandas dot concat to concatenate them together. So lower outliers and upper outliers are being concatenated along axis one, so side by side. Um, and let's let's just store that in outliers. Then I'll return outliers to see what's going on. Okay, so this is the array from our lower bounds. And this is the array from our upper bounds. Um, so again, we only care if, if there's one in a given row. We don't care if it's lower or upper. If there's a given, if there's an outlier in any of the rows, we're just going to drop that row. So we'll use any again here along axis one to give us just a final true or false if there's an outlier in that uh, in that row. So we'll do dot any on axis one, uh, and now that will return if I. Just drop that. That will return what we just saw. Finally, we can use this um, at, in order to drop the outliers. So, um, right. So I, I just want the indices for this. So I can index this in X. Use this whole thing as an indexer for X, and that will just give us the examples where the trues are. We can then type dot index uh, to get the actual just indice values. Uh, index values. So that's what I'll do here. I'll take uh, I'll take our data frame, use it as an indexer, and then type dot index. And so if I remove this, uh, you can see we now just get the indices back from outliers. Finally, we'll drop the outliers. So df equals df dot drop outliers axis zero, which is the row axis. Um, We'll then print out the length of the outliers, seeing how many outliers we have, and examples dropped. So if we run this now, um, well, actually, we want to return df. You can see how it tells us how many examples are dropped, and then it returns us the data frame without the outliers. So that's the function. Um, a little involved, but I think we got it. Uh, last thing. I might want to reset the indices on this. We're missing indices now. So I might as well go in here and type dot reset index drop equals true to prevent the old indices from becoming a new column. All right, and there we go. So here's our function, and now let's see if it works. So what I'll call is, I'll call this outliers df, just as a temporary data frame. Um, 
And notice also that if we sp if we increase the threshold on here, uh, maybe up to 20.25, you can see many more examples are being dropped. If we lower this down, we have fewer examples that are being dropped. All right, so now let's replot the box plots uh, after the uh, examples have been dropped. So once we have our outliers DF, we're gonna again, let's just take this code right here and modify it. Um, so only difference here is now the data is not coming from EDA DF, it's coming from outliers DF. And the color, why don't we change it to cornflower blue. All right, now this is box plots without outliers. Let's take a look. All right, um, and as we can see, we have dropped outliers. Um, if we look back up here, they, they're up here, we still see them, but now down on these new distributions, they're gone. Now we still have some outliers in these examples. So maybe by if we up our um, threshold value, maybe up to 8%, um, we should see that uh, they are gone as well. Now did I misspell this column name, online boarding? I don't have that one in here. Oh, it's interesting. When we drop some examples, more were coming up as um, outliers. Now I wouldn't actually, no, I don't know if I consider these outliers because they weren't in the original. You can see there weren't, they weren't there when these guys were present. They only became outliers when we changed uh, the distribution uh, by dropping some of the rows. So, I don't know. I think I'll leave that one out. Uh, I wouldn't consider those ones outliers. Onboard service, these two, and check-in service though. Have they been fixed? Uh, yes, no more here, no more here, and they're not here. So let me just lower this. I want to try to find the optimal value. Try 6%. Uh, we still have we still have some. So let's do 7. And 7 seems to have worked. Uh, we do have an online boarding. Uh, but like I said, I'm not worrying about that one because they weren't originally outliers. All right. So now, now that we've dropped the outliers, let's actually fi fi finish um, finish our pre-processing, finalizing model inputs, and then we'll do the training. So I'll create this function finalize inputs, which is like pre-process inputs with the second half. I'm going to take in a data frame, and here we're going to actually specify if we want to drop the outliers or not. So by default, I won't drop them. I'll have outliers on true. And we'll also specify a threshold. By default, will be 0.5, which will only be used if outliers is false. So maybe I'll call this keep outliers, keep outliers. OK, so first thing is we'll remove the outliers, only if keep outliers is false. So if keep outliers is false, then we'll use our function uh, remove outliers that we wrote, uh, store the result in data frame, uh, and then this, is, we're going to pass in df, the columns we want, you know, let me just copy this so we don't have to write this all out. It's like this, and I'll just indent this up. Okay, so if keep outliers equals false, we'll update the data frame with removing the outliers, except the outlier threshold is given here like that. Oh, and the DF has to be DF. Okay. So now what? Um, now we're going to split the data frame into X and Y, where Y is what we're trying to predict. So Y is going to be just the satisfied column, the satisfaction. Yeah, satisfaction column. Um, and X is all the rest of the data. So we're dropping satisfaction from axis one. And then we'll do the train test split. Um, this is going to use, do this as a hyphen. This is going to use the train test split function from sklearn. 
and I pass in x and y, specify a train size. We'll just send 70% of the data to the train set. Include shuffle equals true, and set a random state of one. And that will return our new sets of the data. Uh, x train, x test, y train, and y test. All right, and this is what we'll return. Uh, so return that. And the last thing to do is scale the data. We'll use a standard scaler um, from sklearn, and that will just give each column uh, the same range of values. It will, it will give a, each column a mean of zero and a variance of one. So we'll do scalar.fit on the train set only, because we want to sort of pretend we don't have access to the test set when we're doing this. Um, and then scalar.transform the train set and also the test set. So uh, this actually returns a NumPy array. So I'm going to turn it back into a data frame afterwards. Um, specifying the indexes, indices should stay as they were, and the columns should stay as they were. All right, and then we'll copy this over. This is x test. So we're transforming both x test and x train using the fit we have only to x train. All right, and let's get the values back over here. So this is finalized inputs. Um, and we specify the keep outliers, uh, we pass in x. Keep outliers will be true. So we don't have to specify a, an outlier threshold. All right, and so here's our final data. Um, now what I'd like to do is first train uh, with outliers to see what our baseline performance is. So let's create a model. Um, I'm gonna call it model one. It's gonna be a logistic regression model. And we'll fit model one to the train set. And we'll print out the accuracy value for the model on the test set. Test accuracy. Um, we'll display it to three decimal places with a percent sign and format this with model1.score, x test1, y test1. Oh, actually, I should call them that. Yeah, so I'm going to call these all 1, like this. Uh, so run that. Y train 1 just looks like this. I mean, x train 1 looks like this. Y train 1 will be our feature, our labels. Um, So let's print out the accuracy. All right, uh, actually I wanna multiply it by 100 since it's a percentage. All right, so 83% accuracy, uh, it's pretty good. But now let's try it without the outliers. Training, well, let me do it this way. Without outlier removal. And this will be training with outlier removal. Uh, this one, let me put these on the same line, same block. Um, so this will be, uh, we'll take this again. This is x train two, x test two, whoa, sorry. Y train two, y test two. And this is keep outliers equals false because now we're dropping the outliers. And the outlier threshold uh, can be 5%. Then we'll create a model two, which is also logistic regression. And fit the model, model two, to the train set, X train, Y train. And we'll print out, I'll just copy this over. Uh, just change this to model two, and this to X two, X test two, and Y test two. Also, these have to be ones, and these have to be twos. All right, now the comparison. So here we have 83%, and with this, dropping the outliers, we uh, it has not changed. Actually, it went down. But let's see if we modify our threshold up to 7%. It actually went up by 1%. Let's modify it some more. So I'm just sort of uh, searching around here for the best one. Looks like maybe a higher one is better here. Ah, that's pretty good. Oh, we're getting pretty high, 10%. Uh, now we are dropping a substantial amount of data at this point. Um, and it's hard to say 
of what is the optimal value. We may want to try out with a bunch of different values to figure it out. But it's looking like maybe we're getting a good result at around, uh, what was it, 50, uh, 10%? Pretty high, uh, pretty good. Or 15, was it? No, what about 12? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, I also, why don't we try dropping these ones to see if it goes up. So all we have to do is in our function specify online boarding as well. Uh, and retrain. This should be unchanged. This one. Oh, it went up. So it actually looks like dropping those outliers worked. And if we see this, uh, if we put online boarding on here as well, we should see uh, that, oh, we still have one. So what if we bump this up to 0 0.8, 0 0.08? Uh, then we have dropped them all from out online boarding. So now we have no more um, outliers. And down here uh, with the threshold, what about 0 0.05? 83, so that didn't really work up to 0 0.8. Uh, it goes up to 85%. So we actually are getting a good performance increase there. Uh, and that looks even better. So, um, yeah, you can see that uh, by doing the outlier removal, although we dropped a lot of the data, um, we did improve the performance of the model on the same test set. Uh, actually, hmm, it's a bit, it's a bit misleading. What we really should do is drop them only on the train set. Ah, that's going to require some more work. I'm not going to do it. Uh, it's it, We probably should only do this on the train set. We want to keep the test set the same between comparisons. Ah, why not? Let's just do it. Okay, I'm going to copy this over over here. Uh, that will do it right before we scale. Uh, so what we're going to have to do is, after we do the train test split, we're going to put the train DF back together. Uh, train df is going to be concatenation of actually let's do it this way let's bring this down here we'll do the train test split just on x and y uh, so we'll say uh, train df and test df is splitting only df then we will remove the outliers on train df. Uh, and we will split. Okay, we will then split train df and test df into x train and y train. So uh, y train will be train df sub satisfaction. And Y test will be test df dot satisfaction. Then x train is going to be train df dot drop satisfaction, and x test is going to be test df dot drop satisfaction. And this should be good. So right, let's try this now. Um, this is unchanged, but this one. Okay, so it, it did not uh, change the results. In fact, it seems like it's not changing the results, so I may have made an error. Uh, it looks like this uh, removal might not be helping. Uh, bumping this up. Wait. Ah, uh, this is very confusing now. <laughs> See, the problem is, um, even with so many examples removed, the accuracy is not changing. It's exactly the same. Am I doing something wrong? Give me one second, I'll inspect this. Oh yeah, I spotted the problem. I'm, I'm not storing this back into train df. Okay, there we go. So this should be unchanged. Uh, this one should be back. Let's do it to 5%. Okay, and it did change, it went down. Uh, let's try bringing it up. And it also went down. Okay. 
So this might actually look like it's not helping. Um, what about a small change? Nope. All right, well, it actually looks like the outlier removal is hindering the performance. So I was quite wrong by uh, doing it to the test set also. Uh, we have to make sure we're keeping the test set intact when we're removing the outliers. Um, it doesn't look like any threshold value I try here is improving the performance. Um, so sometimes outliers are actually helpful to the model. Uh, we have to, it was a, it's on a case by case basis. Um, at least we got to see how we can remove outliers, which is uh, very useful. Bumping this up should only drop the performance further. Yeah, and you can see it will start to tank the more we drop. Yeah, we're, d well, we're down to 81% with a 0.5. All right, but uh, you know, I'm not going to sweat it. Uh, that's fine. Uh, I may, you may be able to reuse this code for a different data set in which there are bad outliers in the data. Um, but thank you so much for watching. Uh, this will sum up the video. Uh, if you enjoyed it, make sure to subscribe and hit the bell for more content and leave any comments you have in the section below. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a fantastic day. Hi guys. Uh, I just want to say before I end the video um, that I actually did some more experimentation and found that if we use a really tiny threshold, uh, really, really, really tiny, so we're dropping only 500 examples, then we actually get uh, a better better performance than the original, but it's by a very small amount. Um, so it looks like maybe there are some bad uh, thresholds, uh, some bad examples in there. By making this tinier and tinier, we might be able to refine this and get bigger. Um, but yeah, any any high uh, any high threshold value here was not working. All right. So again, uh, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys later.